Hi, this is uh, Shantanu Paul, and this is Deep Talk. Uh, welcome to the session of Deep Talk. I'm delighted to uh, have you all um, in this session. And of course, today we have a great topic, the making of a unicorn. And I'm delighted to have with us um, Sudhir Koneru, who's the founder and CEO of uh, Zenoti, which has been one of the very rare few companies, in fact, in the life of every entrepreneur and every startup, uh, becoming a unicorn, is, which is a billion dollar valuation, is a remarkable achievement because the number of people who achieve that is so small. So in that context, having Sudhir here has been a great, uh, I'm sure would be a great matter of encouragement for all the participants in the audience. And I hope this would be a great session going forward. So, uh, so welcome Sudhir. And um, yeah. before I get going on my questions today on Deep Talk, I must also say a couple of disclosures. One is that Sudhir may appear to be slightly sleepy and there's a good reason for it. It's 6 a.m. in Seattle from where he is joining this uh, session. So thank you, Sudhir, for taking the trouble of joining us at this ungodly hour, Monday morning, 6 a.m. And of course, I can say that I can take a bit of liberty with Sudhir of all people because Sudhir and I went to college together in IIT Madras and it was a long time ago. Uh, and of course, the good thing is that therefore we have known each other from the age of 17 or 18 and have been the same college, the same batch, the same hostel, the same wing, and perhaps not very far away neighboring rooms. So with that background, uh, Sudhir, uh, congratulations on this great achievement of having Zanotti becoming a unicorn in recent times. And I'd like to start off at the very beginning, asking you this question. Uh, tell us about how you began your journey at the very beginning, which is your college, uh, your school college, and perhaps uh, the first few interesting jobs that you had in your career before you became a full-time entrepreneur again. Yeah, firstly, uh, happy to be here. And uh, thanks for inviting me uh, to be here. Uh, and uh, thanks for the wishes around our progress as a company. Uh, yeah, I mean, in the sense, uh, in terms of early days, as Shantanu said, of course, he knows everything, but we've, we've pretty much grown up together kind of stuff as kids. But yeah, I went to college at IIT Madras and then did a master's in UT Austin kind of stuff and uh, went on to work at Microsoft. It was the very first company I chose to work at, the only company actually where I actually applied for a job and went and started working uh, out of college for about eight years and I quit in 2000. And I think so Microsoft was, you know, between my early days, Shantan, if you remember when I was working in, in my projects in college also, it was around some operating system stuff with Professor Kalyan Krishnan. And he was a very demanding professor. And, you know, like we learned a lot in terms of the details of writing code very meticulously and actually writing a full operating system. Uh, you know, Debashish and me both used to uh, work late hours and kind of do that. So I think that kind of built on itself because even at Microsoft, you know, it was a very demanding high growth environment when I joined in 92. And so, you know, I, I think solving tough problems was something uh, which I learned a lot even between my education and between being at Microsoft and kind of stuff. And I think Microsoft was a very uh, good window of time in my career where I learned uh, how to build products. And when I left Microsoft, I should say I was Definitely very confident that give me anything and I can solve the product problem uh, in an elegant way kind of stuff in terms of design and, you know, how you write code and uh, all the things, uh, beliefs and principles. So I, I worked on Windows core operating system, uh, device drivers, uh, writing distributed file system. So uh, I was very hands on and learned a lot in those days. And um, I think, yeah, when I quit, I did start this company, which eventually was called some total systems. Of course, I didn't know, I didn't realize what I didn't know when I quit Microsoft. I think me and a couple of other friends uh, quit together, but we didn't realize we were novices when it comes to sales and marketing. We had no clue what it means to sell, uh, who's a buyer, how to assess a buyer and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, I think it was a crash course within 12 months. We had to learn fast enough. Otherwise, uh, you know, that I, I think we, there was more fear, I would say, in, in that startup when we did, where I was very worried. Uh, what will happen to the to us and you know but so we navigated but at the end of the day our product strength helped us to build a great product uh, which ended up being a leader in its category kind of stuff uh, and after about eight years plus I stopped doing that and uh, then that's when the whole Zenoti thing started later on. So uh, I think the sum total story and I want to piggyback on that comment that by the time I think if I remember I think I came back to India in 2003 you must have come back in 2004 if I'm not mistaken right after and you are the few, I think, uh, people of our batch who managed to somehow find a way back into India despite all the temptation of living in the US forever. Uh, so I remember that you came back as some total uh, managing director for India. And I think at that point in time, you must have been, what, 40 years old or maybe a little younger. But all, all things said and done, 
you know, uh, the corporate career would have been lucrative, life was comfortable, you know, you have reached the zenith of a multinational software company and you are the MD for India. And I think most people at that time kind of say, let's play golf and improve our golf game, right? But having said that, I think you did something remarkable from my memory. You kind of quit the software sector altogether and you went to start and run a gym called Latitude on road number 36 in Hyderabad. And since I also live in Hyderabad, you know, we had a lot of conversations around that time. But to say that to go into running a gym and a salon and a spa, what was going through your mind to take such a radical departure from what you had done until that point? Because until that point, you were a software guy, done all the entrepreneurial stuff, corporate stuff, all the good stuff. And nobody would have blamed you for just sticking to your guns and saying, you know what, I'm going to do this for another 50, uh, another 20, 30 years and retire peacefully. But you went to yeah. form a gym or a salon and a spa called Latitude, which is an interesting story, which people I'm sure would love to hear. So tell us your motivations for doing something so radical. Yeah, so I think, yeah, it was all coincidence in terms of how Zenoti has come about, because to your point, after some total, I, I did, uh, you know, uh, I, I was just before 40 when I quit some total around 2008 or so. And I said, uh, you know, I'm going to, that's it, I was going to retire. And in fact, I told all my friends, I had to get together saying, hey, man, I'm done working. I'm happy. And, you know, uh, I had even uh, had kids and I would even had a farmhouse. I used to spend a lot of time there. And I did take a couple of years off and traveled quite a bit, learned quite a bit. Uh, I did got into yoga, meditation, generally invested more in fitness, my own personal well-being. And the one thing is I really learned uh, a lot about, you know, when we are early in our careers, we are just so heads down doing the whatever seems logical. You know, you get a certain rank. Okay, you're supposed to do computer science. Chalo. Okay, after you graduate, you're supposed to do a job. Okay, you're supposed to get married. You're supposed to have kids. And you're supposed to do well in your job and grow and, you know, grow up the career ladder or whatever it is in a company like, like I did at Microsoft. And so, but I realized, you know, we are kind of not present to our personal well-being and uh, a consciousness about life and all that stuff. And what does well-being mean? So for me, I, I actually arrived at this whole insight saying first that, uh, you know, fundamentally well-being is about somebody being able to operate at their full potential. You know, when I say full potential, it's like my potential as a husband, my potential as a dad, my potential as a son or at a work workplace, my potential. In all walks of life, if you are able to operate to your full potential, then, you know, you're doing kind of justice or dharma to your, you know, existence in this universe kind of stuff, you know. And I felt, how does, how do I make everyone realize that? Because and then I, it, it occurred to me that, look, when people feel good, right, when people are in a good space in their life, human beings tend to naturally go discover their full potential. Right? You don't need to teach them anything. You just need to uh, make sure they are feeling good and they're investing in all the right things to be more conscious about their life and feeling good. And so then I said, that's what the focus should be. And that's why I started this whole investment in gym, salon, spa. And I used to talk a lot, at, not just as a conventional gym, in our gym, I would post things about, it's not just about being doing exercise, but being present to your exercise, being present to your yoga in your, and that presence will make you be more grounded, which will translate into you discovering what your capability and potential is, uh, kind of stuff. So that's what it led me to do this whole gym thing. And it did translate into a good business. It was about six, uh, we had about almost seven stores in different cities in India kind of stuff. And it was profitable, but, you know, I realized I, I, I'm not cut out for this kind of, uh, you know, so, uh, the consumer oriented business running it. It's not as much fun. So that's why I had to eventually said, no, let's go do software kind of stuff. So, so, I mean, that brings up the question of running latitude. And I don't remember, we've ran for perhaps a few, four or five years, but I'm just thinking that in that period of time, what were the biggest lessons? Of course, one lesson you just mentioned that, you know, you realize that, you know, pushing product to consumer, uh, perhaps in a physical brick and mortar world is not your cup of tea, which would be understandable. If you came from a world of software, a B2B world, and then you have a physical reality of B2C selling, which is a very different ball game. And I personally, in Dallasment, have sort of experienced slash suffered the same set of experiences. But having said that, uh, the learnings from latitude that led to the seed of Zenoti. Could you just walk us through what are the top three, four major learnings that led to Zenoti? And at what point did you wake up and say, you know what, it's time to go and build a software business to help such organizations around the world? Yeah. So I think first is uh, business on the business front. I did realize I was trying to run my own business with multiple stores in different cities. And it was very hard to run my business because, you know, these are service industries where you know, it's not like you're moving retail products inside a shop where you can keep count of your retail and all that. And so 
the kind of software capabilities you need to monitor such a business and be on top of it and make sure employees are motivated in all the stores. Uh, there was nothing out there that you know was uh, available in my, you know, though I tried multiple options. So I did see there is a need. And then I thought I was the only one. Then I realized after, a say, after thinking about it on a global front, I said, so all the businesses globally are having to do, uh, make, make do with what I am doing kind of stuff. So that was one good awareness, which made me realize there is a need for software. Uh, now, having said that, I think to, your, to, to the point I said, when I said being present to our potential in life, then I realized, wait a second, you know what my potential from a career perspective, from a work professional perspective is, I have built all this expertise in knowing software and all that stuff. So if I'm so passionate about this industry and I want everyone, uh, you know, I want to, everyone to invest in wellness, be more conscious, be more aware of their life, well, I can say I'll become a counselor or become a personal trainer or a yoga teacher, or maybe go build software for the entire industry so that, you know, so that's our passion today is to say, hey, we'll build software so that you guys can do what you do best and, you know, touch more people's lives. And that's why I was passionate and said, let's go ahead and start this. And, uh, you know, I ended up with a bunch of people who are interested in working uh, in buildings and OT. So uh, that's how it came about. So. So that's interesting. So you kind of took your uh, lifelong experience as a software engineer and a software professional married to the domain that you're looking at and realizing that this is not your cup of tea. But if you just step back from the whole thing, you see a much bigger picture of all business in the world, which are of this type that are struggling with the automation aspect of this business. And that was the genesis of uh, Zenoti, right? So, yes. so if you move on from your pre-Zenoti days now to the Zenoti journey itself, it's been what, a decade, perhaps a little more. And in that time frame, you have essentially taken on a niche perhaps somewhat of an overlooked industry, which most software engineers and professionals and entrepreneurs wouldn't pay too much attention to it. You kind of went in there at a time when this was not fashionable to do it. I mean, I'm using the word fashionable for a fashion industry, but we understand that it was not fashionable to be providing software to the so-called wellness industry, but you did that. And then a decade later, you have disrupted perhaps a whole bunch of, uh, you know, uh, complacent, perhaps a little bit of an old fashioned, old school, uh, you know, companies that are probably operating in that space, you know, in every space, there are some technology and software vendors, no matter how bad or how good. So you went to that and 10 years later here, you would emerge as the naughty, this disrupted the whole industry. So I'm curious, you know, from a strategic point of view and, you know, connecting it back to your product strategy strength earlier, what were the top two, three product strategic decisions that you made uh, in terms of the product you're offering that you think has caused this disruption and led to evaluation of this type? Yeah. So I, I think, yeah, very much so in the sense, uh, you know, in the early days, of course, since I said uh, I was researching these stores, brands, which have multiple stores, and my background was from enterprise software, as I said, building software for large businesses. It wasn't about uh, building software for a small store somewhere, you know, that was like, you know, even, even though I did software for this industry and for large businesses, to your point, Shantanu, a lot of people would call me and say, what are you doing? I mean, are you crazy or what? Why would you sit and build software for barbershops? You know, are you, you know, can't you do something better kind of stuff, right? And, you know, I, because it's such a small market. I mean, in, in the past, I've built software for the, the top S&P 500 or Windows core uh, operating system stuff, et cetera. So the potential to do solve harder problems might have been there. But, uh, you know, I was, of course, I was passionate about the space and that's why I ended up starting. And, but today it is becoming a trend where a lot of these businesses, industries, you, if you pick restaurants or anything, you're finding vertical software solutions, which solve the entire spectrum of problem for those industries kind of stuff. And so it, uh, that, that's where, it, uh, though I didn't have that necessarily visibility saying, oh, that's going to happen for sure. I knew in our space, this uh, problem needs to be solved. So the first thing is we did focus only on enterprise uh, businesses. Enterprise means brands which have like 20 or more outlets, that kind of people, because that's where we felt, hey, we bring a value proposition to the table. Uh, and, you know, we don't want to necessarily go sell to the person who has a single store. Now, selling to the single store person is an easier proposition because it's software that is very easy to build. It's very easy to convince someone also to buy it. You know, when you try and sit in front of someone who has a hundred stores and convince them, it is harder to convince. So, but I think that's one thing we were lucky. We, because of our innate nature to build enterprise software and coming from that background, we actually solved the enterprise software problem uh, in this industry. And there was no competition in that category at the top because I was also struggling to find a software to help me run my multi-store multi brand. And so we, 
could get some legs under our business uh, after the first two years. It did take more time to develop the software because it took almost two years for us to just develop what we wanted to sell kind of stuff. It wasn't like something six months we were in the market, I think, uh, because we are a very comprehensive product for the industry, essentially. Uh, so that was one key decision around, uh, you know, the whole notion of focusing on large enterprise and focusing first on, we used to call ourselves manage my spa. And because we wanted to say uh, to our customers and to our employees, this is all we are about. We help people manage spas kind of stuff because that was a problem that I felt, you know, was really not solved at all. And it was too niche and too narrow. Uh, but that helps when you're niche and narrow, you know, everybody focuses, your employees are super clear what we are doing. Our customers are super clear. If you run a spa multi-store, you should talk to these guys. And it gave us velocity to get out of the gate with some early revenue. Uh, and of course, we focused on India first because I happened to be there at the time. And, you know, I understood the Indian market also pretty well in the industry. So that kind of brings up the question which I've always meant to ask you. And I think in many ways, I think by the time Zenoti came into its own mid, I would say 2013, 14, 15 timeframe, it began to show its sort of presence in India. Um, you know, that was also a time that enterprise SaaS business in India started getting more cool until then it was all e-commerce companies were getting funded. And, you know, you guys were the, perhaps the first generation, first wave of enterprise SaaS companies coming out of India because until then nobody believed India could build a global product or a global SaaS business. I think you were in the first wave of that uh, realization. But one thing that struck me as, you know, uh, like you said, you started in India. Technically, the Indian market is always supposed to be infinitely uh, out there. But you made a very radical choice to relocate yourself and your business and say, uh, flip the headquarters and make it a US-based company and go after a global market rather than chase the India market for much longer. So I think that was perhaps an interesting and perhaps, again, a risky decision. In, in hindsight, of course, worked out very well. But at that point in time to say, I know this market, I'm getting some success here, my traction is building, and I suddenly lock, stock, and barrel say, you know, let me move out of, move to the US. And then from there, I want to build a global company now. And India is just a small part of my story going forward. And most people, again, would advise you just like, you know, why are you building software for barbershops? Why, why would you move your base when you're getting traction in a market like India? So this is one question that I thought people should understand the answer to because I'm sure it's a non-intuitive uh, logic that you had behind it. So please share that. Yeah. yeah, so you're right. So we were doing very well in India for an enterprise SaaS kind of company. It wasn't very often that you can sell in India. You know, most people, companies develop software, but, you know, may not be as successful in uh, making revenue in India. And we could have gone further in India. We could have gone downstream. It wasn't like we had finished every customer. We only focused on the big brands and we won people like Enrich, Lakme, or Kaya, Skincare, et cetera. And then we could have gone down to the broader market and made a big market as well. But the thing is, when you do the analysis of the size, I, and my goal was, by the way, I, because of some total, because of, as I said, I'm retired kind of stuff, I was like, hey, I don't want to deal with this night shift and deal with the US and time zone. And I feel it's very agonizingly painful kind of stuff, which I went through in the sum total days. And so, but, and so we used to sell in Southeast Asia and Middle East and all the nearby countries. And we felt this is nice. You know, we're making progress. And we did have all the top tier brands, even in Middle East using Zenoti, et cetera. Uh, but then we realized when you do the math about the outcome you want to build. So coming to your earlier, you said, you know, good, you're a unicorn. Like, I mean, there's no way Zenoti would be a unicorn trying to do what we're doing in that market, you know, in the India, Southeast Asia, Middle East, because the entire addressable market uh, is, uh, you know, probably, you know, South, maybe only a billion dollars worth of revenue at any point. Like if it's the whole market is a billion, then I'm going to make so less as a company. No investor is going to get excited about uh, Zenoti kind of stuff and the upside potential uh, because you don't get value based on, um, you know, uh, just how much revenue you have. You get value based on the future potential of the company kind of stuff. And so I think that was a time where we had to make a decision when our first investor, Axel, uh, you know, who came at the table and wanted to invest money in Zenoti, was if we are going to do this, then you have to look for a big outcome. You can't just say, this is a lifestyle business for Sudhir where he's happy making some money every month and every employee is happy making a little money. And so I think we all had decided this would be nice. And to your point, you know, building enterprise SaaS out of India was another passion for me, which was another driver, actually, where I felt, hey, maybe this is an opportunity to show. You don't just have to set up an outsourced office for a sum total or a Microsoft or a captive office, but we can actually build software and sell from India to the rest of the world. And uh, so that led me to uh, start the whole thing. 
But if you really want to make a big outcome and make employees be very firmly rewarded with that big outcome, you know, valuations turn out to be reward for employees, you know, only then we, uh, we have to go to the US is what I realized. And so it was a choice and it was almost like a reset point. It was like I was starting this company all over again because when you come to the US and you want to do this, it's not like I know people in the you know, beauty industry in the US. All my connections and contacts have nothing to do with the beauty industry. And they're like, how can we help you? No one can. So I had to start from scratch as though it was a yet again and building the company all over again. So that's actually an interesting question. And I'll ask my uh, outcome question first and come back to this point about moving to the US and what happened thereafter, right? Uh, so obviously the decision to go global has paid off in hindsight handsomely, right? Your unicorn status, and I, I'd also love to know at what point you start believing that unicorn status is even possible. Because I'm sure on day one, you didn't believe it was gonna happen. At some point it became an aspiration, some point it became a reality in terms of your mind, and then some point reality in, on paper, right? So, so that is one question I have. And the other question linked to that is, you know, today, if you look back and say, what is the profile of revenue I have across the globe? How how does how do the different continents add up in your total profile in a pie chart? What is the ratio of revenue you get from different parts of the world? Today, yeah, sixty percent of our revenue is the United States, and uh, you know, I would say twenty percent or twenty five percent is between UK and uh, Australia. New Zealand is the second markets for us, and then maybe about fifteen percent from the rest of India, Middle East, uh, those Southeast Asia regions. So very quickly, as you can see, you've flipped the model to become a very clearly, you know, first world first kind of uh, audience, which is great for revenue. And I'm sure the, the realizable dollars per customer are much, much higher, which is fabulous. So my question around when you move back to the US, you just referred in passing to the earlier comment saying that, you know, you had to struggle to build things all over again. It sounds like what you're saying, you built the company twice, once in India and then again in the US. So could you talk about your struggles in the US? You know, of course. Yeah, so, yeah. So in the US, that's, that, that is very true what you said. I actually felt that way about Zenoti that, hey, I'm having to do this a second time. It's kind of silly, you know, I have to start all over again kind of stuff, you know, because so when we came to the US, it was hard to know how do we get people's attention? The business models in the US were quite different and the requirements were quite different. You know, here people pay a monthly subscription fee for a spa. You pay $60 a month and you get a massage, et cetera. Whereas in India, you just pay for your service. Maybe you buy 10 massages at a time or something like that. Uh, so the, the, and the payments, how credit cards are processed and handled in the US are very different than in India, even today. So it was very tricky about uh, learning about the market because our product wasn't going to get accepted as is by anybody kind of stuff. And uh, so luckily I had a, 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 one of uh, ex Microsoft folks who also joined me when I said move to India with Bamshi, who's one year junior from, from, in, from IIT Madras itself. And so, you know, we literally used to go to stores and we would get services. We would talk to the employees, we would talk to the store managers, we would try to understand what is their problems? What is it that keeps them awake? What is their management worried about? And so, or what is their guests, uh, you know, problems in doing business with them? And that's how we kind of started learning about you know, if you want to make inroad into these brands, what is the message that would resonate and what is the product features we need? And the good part is, so what we did is, okay, since so we start building some of those features, but we more than building the features, we, I did, you know, start sending out outbound messages to the top CEOs of some of these brands uh, with focused message from what I learned about their business saying, hey, this is what I learned learned and I do think I can solve these problems for you with Zenoti. Now, I may not have had the whole product to solve those problems, but the point is I had a message which was resonating and that's what resulted in them calling me back kind of stuff. Because earlier I was like, how do I get them to call me back? How do I get to have the meaningful conversations? And so, but when you do your research and send a note with the right message, uh, I can tell you why, when I did that, I did it only with four brands, researched them extensively, sent to all four, uh, I did get responses from three of them, uh, and one of them responded like within 30 minutes, and he was on a, he wanted to talk to me like right away because he said I have never met somebody who understood my business problem so well in, in terms of and I framed it in just like three sentences. It wasn't like a long email. So you seem to have got so, the elevator pitch right. So what was that elevator pitch? I mean, this is a great uh, masterclass for entrepreneurs and one of the entrepreneurs in this audience. So. You know, you study all these complex, large companies which are making perhaps millions of dollars of revenue. And then, you know, you are coming from India and suddenly you are showing up on their stores and knocking on their door, talking to store level managers and employees and trying to derive this insight that can result to the CEO of the company. So what was the elevator pitch? If you don't mind sharing some of those early insights. Yeah, 
So at a, at a big picture level, it was, it was saying that, hey, I understand that your customers are having trouble to use their membership when they buy them in one store, whereas they want to use and redeem it in another store, or that your stores are not getting paid on time when you set, when you pay the money. That is, if you're paying some membership somewhere, but some other guy needs to get the money, that, that balancing is not happening in an automated way by your finance teams, uh, and that your employees are frustrated that, you know, when they work in two, one store for two days and another store for three days in the same city, they don't get their commissions properly calculated any month because the software is not helping it. So Zenodi can solve these problems because we're an enterprise class software, which, you know, gives all your customers a unified view of your business and they can transact with your business no matter where they go, et cetera. Very interesting. So it sounds like you basically built a studio on frictionless cash flow, right? You know, that you can collect your money faster, your suppliers can get paid faster, your employees can get their money faster, and they can be more portable across your various branches because, you know, perhaps the workload demand is different and you need to move people around. So it all boils down to, you know, efficient finances and cash flow management. Would that be revenue cycle management? Would that be a reasonable characterization? Yeah, I would say, and multi-store management, like you have multiple stores and the cash flow in the multi-store scenario, the cash flow and revenue management is what was the focus kind of stuff. Yes. So you're in the early days. Over time, it has kept evolving, but, you know, that was where we started. You're telling you basically that, you know, as an enterprise, your end customer, the consumer is tied to a branch when they should be tied to your brand and you're creating artificial obstacles for them to go across you know, branches seamlessly and that's something you can solve. Precisely, precisely, yes. Wonderful. So changing gears uh, to a next set of questions and you know, everybody who's an entrepreneur talks about you know, valuation and fundraising as if that's like oxygen and everybody wants to become big, everybody wants to measure success in terms of their valuations and so forth, right? And I think you also mentioned in passing that revenues are one thing, but your potential for how much you can grow and what, what kind of market size that exists uh, that determines your uh, valuation. So you've obviously proven yourself over the last 10 years that you are a master at raising money and a master at raising valuation, which is magical, uh, fantastic, and, and congratulations. And that's why we are having this conversation too, to a large extent. So if you look at that experience of 10 years, um, what are the two, three major insights you'd like to share with the audience around? You know, what does it take to create that aura of you know, we are going to be very big someday and therefore we deserve a very high valuation. Uh, I'm just curious, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of stories and pitches and positioning you had to do to get this kind of uh, traction with investors? Yeah. So I think that's a little complex, but there are multiple facets which may go into something like that, right? I do believe there's some amount of karma and being at the right place, right time is matters kind of stuff. It's not always just to be, you're always busy, you know, uh, trying to live life and think we are building life and life happens to us on the side kind of stuff. So I think a lot of uh, the ecosystem has gotten very passionate about this whole notion that companies coming out of India have a unique advantage when it comes to building SaaS software in terms of talent, in terms of cost structures, because, you know, I do want to emphasize talent. Uh, it's not just a cost structure thing, you know, trying to build the same company out of the US completely, you know, if I had tried that, I think it will be very hard finding the right people to come and build that kind of software for uh, in, the, in Seattle would have been very challenging, retaining, driving that kind of a business. So I think there's a whole thesis saying if you are having a good talent pool in, the, in India and you've been able to figure out how to build software from India and come and sell it on a global landscape, I think people do appreciate there is value behind it and investors do want to seek out such companies. That's a good trend that's happening nowadays kind of stuff. And the second is, of course, you know, the main thing is you do need a, need a product to have the passion to solve some product problem and show that you have a good product market fit. When we have enough brands which are signing up for Zenoti in terms of solving the problem we just discussed about a unified brand for that company, uh, and most other businesses don't have such a unified brand experience, then it is apparent to investors that, okay, eventually everybody will have to make this choice. They can't continue to run their business the way they are running. So it's more a matter of time that Zenodi can get more customers. Now, the other thing which stops us is, okay, there could be three other players who you're competing with and selling against. Uh, but since we chose a very narrow market, which is 
brands with multiple outlets, more than 20 outlets. We got very good at it. You know, the brands with 20 outlets and above, our software got so good at it, our people got so good at it, our processes were geared towards that, that nobody else can compete with us in that category. And all other people said, okay, you guys go handle that 20 plus store thing. We will go focus on the people who have one store, two stores. And because anyway, that's a bigger market. You know, they felt like, hey, by the way, on a global basis, only about 25% of the stores are fall into the category that we target. 75% uh, of the stores fall into the category that the rest of the software players are targeting. So they left this space to us. So now basically our investors love the fact that, hey, no competition, definitely you're, you're, you're solving a problem which is a need is there. Every one of these people in the 25% category have to choose a software over the next few years. Uh, and so, you know, the, the growth potential ahead of you is there. I think so. That's why you, you do get uh, recognized for that and get the right kind of valuations. And yeah. So essentially, your competition has moved on to the long tail and you have kind of occupied that top 25% of the market in terms of size and volume, big brands. So in some sense, your marketing is happening because big brands are your customers and you don't have to explain to anybody why these companies exist. And, you know, so that way, by choosing to be the premium segment player in this B2B segment, you have kind of also solved your marketing and branding problem. Yeah. So I think choosing to solve the harder problem of big focusing on, because it is the harder problem, solving the enterprise problem, by the way, it's much easier to solve the single store problem. There's tons of people who do it. Uh, gave us the uh, credibility with the investors also saying, hey, these guys know how to solve hard problems. They have made a very clear choice about the problem they want to solve. They have been very disciplined to stick to the in the segment they're not going after. Because it's very tempting, by the way, as an entrepreneur, you will get leads from, even today, we get, over the last three years, I would say more than 70% of the people who knock on Zenoti's door, like fill out a form and say, can we take a demo of software? We actually turn them away, even before the demo. We just say, look, I mean, we are not designed for you. And we are just designed for a different kind of company. And the, that discipline percolates through our company, you know, in the sense, some sales guy can't get smart about it and go make a sale happen because the implementation team will say, what the heck, I'm not going to implement this. You know, you can, so nobody even tries even to break the uh, culture in the company. Interesting. So if you look at the, I think if I, if I remember what you told me before, uh, you know, you raised between 200, 200, 300 billion dollars over the last 10 years. That's a lot of money. Uh, if you look at resource allocation, you know, how are you using these funds? Are you trying to enter adjacent markets? Are you trying, and of course, we'll come to the question of COVID, which I'm sure has its own implications. But going forward, and of course, the way you've been allocating resources, where are you deploying this capital? What are the use cases? Yeah. So first is, see, give, being, having very efficient operations, we've always not been very hungry for cash in the sense we don't spend as much, burn as much money on a monthly basis. That's been a big positive. And that's actually makes our valuation also be attractive because people feel like, okay, you don't, so when you don't need the cash, there's more cash available kind of stuff because you seem to be more efficiently run. Uh, that's been lucky. And, uh, uh, but in terms of that, first is we are looking at other verticals. So, you know, we, we, we recently started the whole group classes, yoga studios and Pilates and all that kind of uh, segment. And we launched with a very large customer in the US called Core Power Yoga, probably the largest yoga business in the world kind of stuff. They have more than 250 stores uh, kind of thing. So that was a new vertical we got into. Then similarly, we are looking at you know, you may feel like, hey, the whole industry is pass along, but there are segments within this industry we don't focus on. Like we don't sell to hotel spas. Now we are starting to focus on hotel spas. There's reason because hotel spas have certain different requirements. Uh, then we are looking at pet grooming and pet spas. You know, it's a booming industry on a global basis. As people are more lonely, they have more pets and the pet industry is growing. So we have recently signed up a very large pet uh, brand called Pet Retail. And so we expect to get into that vertical. Uh, now, further, I mean, we are getting into new markets in the sense regional markets with language. Uh, we, so far, we've been English only kind of thing, uh, but we'll be establishing more presence in other non-English speaking countries as well uh, later this year. That's an in, that, and those things require some investment in sales and marketing and localization and all that. So the capital helps in that way. And then the other way we will use the capital is there are a lot of, uh, desktop software. See, before we came along, what were people using? They were all using some desktop software. You install it on your computer, the old school uh, Windows type of thing. So we, there is an opportunity to look at some smaller software companies which are there globally 
and buy those companies and be able to migrate uh, the entire customers to uh, a better cloud-based system. Uh, so when such opportunities arise, we would look at some M&A opportunities as well in that area. So the capital gives us the flexibility to you know, make those investments when they show up. So one of the things that, of course, comes to mind uh, is that the business you're in, your end customers are enterprise, large, medium, of course, in your case, large and medium, uh, multi-store enterprises offering these uh, beauty and wellness services. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has now lasted a year and a half. Uh, and, uh, you know, you kind of, the first impression would be that it's a high touch business that your customers are engaged in. It's a B2C retail walk-in kind of a business. Uh, and those are businesses that you normally associate with a big freeze on uh, people not being able to, you know, consume these services because it involves walking into a, you know, you can't consume a massage digitally, for example, right? You can't get out and give me a massage. But having said that, so that has that affected your outlook or the sector that you're servicing? What is their outlook in terms of their future and bullishness versus bearishness? And to what extent has that played into your business? Yeah, so firstly, when COVID came, definitely there was a big impact, right? The whole industry got shut down, like you know, globally kind of thing. And it was a problem time even for us and our customers didn't have any revenues. Imagine going from having revenue to zero revenue kind of stuff for our customers. But luckily, uh, you know, we were not as badly impacted because we, were, we only work with the leading brands, as I said, right? Not with the small stores. And so they may have membership oriented businesses where they have to keep collecting money still from their customers. So they were still paying our software subscription in those uh, tough times, though there was some, some impact for us a little bit. Uh, but when COVID got done, these businesses were the ones which came back. Nobody's going to shut down. Like if you have a brand like Kaya, if you have a brand like Lacne, just because COVID came, Lacne is not going to shut down their whole business. But so they, so we, we were lucky that way that uh, among all the software players, we were the most resilient, we came out strong. And then also around the same time, we had introduced a lot of capabilities to say, hey, you can do touchless uh, Uber-like experiences in a salon. That is, you don't need to go into a salon, take out your card, you like an Uber driver, you book an appointment, you check in automatically when you walk into a salon, the stylist knows you're there, they pick you up, they finish the service, they say, I'm done with the service on their phone, like an Uber driver, and your phone pops up and asks you to pick a tip and you walk out kind of stuff and you don't need to talk to the front desk or have any personal touch. Uh, to all The entire experience is touchless. So that resonated with the brands and they really picked up uh, even more so uh, in buying our software. So our COVID turned around with our messaging tweak and everything uh, turned, out, turned out to be a very big positive window. We had a 100% growth rate last year and then this year also on track to 100%. And that's in the context where the entire industry and other software players were suffering. They were, you know, going, you know, reducing and shrinking in size, whereas we were coming out really strong. And that may led us to have some of that strong investor interest in terms of what we were doing was right. So. so just for clarification, are you saying that your customers' total business has actually grown through the pandemic? Or are you saying that you have been able to grab a bigger part of their IT spend because yeah. you are given the most so, of relevant to the pandemic no so we have been able to get more of their it spend that's one thing and then coming to your actual the other question which you had which was what do i think is the impact to this industry during covid like longer term also if you look out uh, what we've discovered really is you know this whole notion that this is one of the few industries by the way if you think about it you go into uh, any you go into a flight you airlines or hotels or anywhere you know versus going to a salon. When you or a spa, when you come out of a spa or a yoga studio or whatever, you don't just look good, you actually feel good, you know? And when you feel good, you do better that day, you elevate your experience, experience whatever, whether you have an interview to go to or you have a problem to solve, you're gonna go solve it better. And there are not many industries which actually do that to you. You know, this is the only, you have to think about it. What is the large scale industry? which, you know, you, yes, your counselor, if you have a board or psychologist, maybe the counselor can make you feel good and walk out, you know, feeling good. But what at large scale touches people's lives? Where is it that you allow somebody to come and touch you, touch your skin, touch your hair? You know, where do you go? You, in the restaurant, you're not going to let someone come and touch you kind of stuff, you know? So this is the one place where people do walk out feeling good. And what we have found is there, the, when COVID opened, you know, started opening in each country, People were craving to go back into these places in spite of the risks. So there is the human touch is a very essential and important element. And this industry is 
not uh, initially some investors thought the industry itself will be written off like you know in the sense people will go to do it yourself personal care at home uh, read, uh, but the service industry will die uh, but what we have found is that's not true at all and i think there is some truth to the fact that this industry will be more resilient if anything going forward that's uh, extremely fascinating. So let me, uh, I mean, in fact, that's uh, sometimes you realize the contra thoughts, right? I mean, there is a whole argument that uh, as we get more automation, um, high touch businesses will do well. I mean, that's a perfect example that we are in some sense fatigued and overloaded by technology. I mean, in, in a way, technology is good, has given us so many great things to even, you know, survive the pandemic and keep running our businesses. But on the other hand, you know, the craving for human touch and human attention may actually have gone up manifold in this period, which seems to be what's happening with your uh, customers' businesses, which is kind of an unexpected but very happy outcome, right, for, for, uh, for you. Um, so moving on, uh, I want to address uh, the transition of this whole thing. But before I get to that new technology dimension and new uh, future that you have in mind, I'm also curious to know that, you know, um, at various points in time, you have mentioned that to, to me that, you know, look, one of the things you're trying to do is not just build a company for investors and promoters and founders, but you want to build a company for employees, right? You want to actually have Zenoti member associates, employees, uh, be also be part of this wealth creation process. So I'm just curious as to what has been your philosophy, what are the things you're doing, and then how is that different from other tech companies in the US today? Yeah. So I think, see, um, I had this early exposure at Microsoft and all of us being from IT industry, you know, it's the people who create the value behind software companies. It is the talent, right? It's not like we are buying a land, doing mining and, you know, going and selling some new screen, you know, to new hardware products to people which require resources. It's all intellectual capital that we are selling at the end of the day. That's all. It's people's minds that is being used to build software and, uh, you know, uh, to monetize that. And so, you know, in the early days at Microsoft, those are the times when the whole notion of stock options and ownership in the company uh, had come to life. And, you know, it really uh, created a, a wave of people who were making, uh, who were getting into financial freedom at a scale which they never imagined. You know, when I was, uh, you know, this kid out of uh, college at working at Microsoft, the amount of money we made was sometimes the problem Bill Gates and others used to say was, people don't even understand the amount of money they've made. You know, this is incredibly uh, insane in terms of how much money for working four or five years in a company. How can you make $5 million or $10 million? It takes a whole lifetime for people to make that kind of money kind of stuff. Uh, but it stayed with me that, hey, the reason that was the program was right and it worked, it motivated everyone, was at the end of the day, it is the intellectual capital which built the value of, Zen of Microsoft. And so the fact that they all shared in that value creation is a logical thing, kind of stuff. And I think, so I, I was very passionate when we did this in India also, I said, I want everyone to realize, hey, if you can be successful at building an enterprise SaaS software business, not a services kind of business like Infosys Pro, the return on it, because it is intellectual capital, which is getting valued, uh, can be huge for employees. And so in the early days, uh, I think people who joined uh, us were obviously convinced about that. Uh, but later on, I've found sometimes, you know, it's hard to make people see it. But now, finally, I think people are starting to see it because, you know, we are, uh, several of our employees at Zenoti, for example, uh, you know, are, of course, extremely wealthy today beyond what they would have thought uh, 10 years ago when they joined, right? So. Wonderful. So uh, my question around, uh, you know, the world at some level has also last four or five years has also gone crazy on uh, AI, data science, digital transformation, et cetera, et cetera. And you are inherently in a business where your customers are forever going to be high touch businesses. There's no concept of a digital spa of course, yoga studios. I get that. I mean, I, I'm not discounting it completely, but the kind of feel good factor comes from a high touch business where people want to come in for a hairdressing appointment or they want to come for a massage or they want to come to a gym to feel good about, you know, really pumping weights, et cetera, et cetera. So these are not going to be ever fully digital businesses. So the question that I have for you is, how does this world of AI, data science, and machine learning, digital transformation affect a company like Zenoti? Does it, is it something that is nice to have and nice to know, or is it something that fundamentally can build your business to the next level with new products and new insights? No, it is uh, it's something which is very fundamental in, uh, in how we can take our company forward to the next level of growth at this stage, and to also take the industry to the next level of growth. Because you know, for the first time you have, because of cloud, because of SaaS, 
you know, there is companies like us who probably have a large volume of data about the industry. You know, you understand the entire consumer spending patterns across the globe. So our data can help us build algorithms which help people to predict various things, to predict, you know, schedules on a weekly basis. How many people should come into the business, uh, you know, should be working in a, in a store? And, you know, businesses, these are tough businesses at the end of the day. They make money only if they predict some things right. If they're overstaffed and people don't show up, then, you know, the business loses money. Uh, if they buy too many uh, retail products on the shelf and you don't buy the retail products, then again, I lose money kind of stuff. So, but today I do think we're now in the phase where Zenoti is moving into the next phase where we are building all these algorithms and we have already started deploying some of them where, you know, Zenoti's algorithms will predict who will come to work and, you know, for how many hours. And, you know, uh, so people don't make those decisions. Our, our software makes decisions. How much product to order so that you have the right product in the store is completely decided by our software, et cetera. So I do think there's more ways. And my thesis is this, which is just like in Uber drivers or whatever, drivers don't think much. They just drive. They trust the Uber network so clearly or Ola network saying, you will make the choice. I know I'll get my money. I'll just drive from point A to point B. You tell me next who to pick up. And same way in our system, our software will decide, you know, and make all the appointments happen, optimize everything. Uh, so people do what they love doing, which is helping people with looking good, feeling good. And, you know, so just do what you're passionate about. Don't do all this mundane administration stuff. Let our platform, trust that our platform will do the right thing. So this is a very interesting uh, point that you made and struck me that, uh, you know, every customer of yours who's an enterprise is either trying to increase revenue or increase profitability or increase cash flow or improve their customer delight and consumer delight, right? So which of these, this, these things do you think using your predictive algorithms, hopefully AI-based, which of these things do you think will be directly impacted and, and therefore the customer stickiness will improve and the reason for you to grow faster will also improve? I think all of most of them, first we are starting with the whole scheduling stuff because the biggest cost in a service business is the schedule, like, you know, employees, how much money do we spend kind of stuff. And the second is the algorithms to predict, which makes our very product very sticky is algorithms which predict pricing. You know, like in this industry, you don't think of like, you know, you're used to saying Ola decides how much money I should pay for the like, ride. And you don't question it today. You just go with it. Earlier, it used to be like per kilometer, I pay so much, et cetera. You know, it's all supply demand based. Whereas even in this industry, I can do that supply demand based thing where on a weekend when the salon is really busy and you want an appointment and you're willing to pay for that appointment extra, then I can make that happen. And not only that appointment, some, in this industry, it's even more specific to, you don't care which driver drives you, by the way, you know, when you drive an Uber, you're like, hey, get me some car. Here, no, I want a haircut with that stylist, you know, because that's the one I want. Well, that stylist is busy, by the way. So uh, if you want a haircut with that stylist, it's $120. Whereas if you're okay with any stylist that I choose, it's only $80. Pick. Now, when we are solving these kinds of problems, our product becomes very sticky because, you know, people do realize that we are making it optimal for helping the employees and the people who are doing a great job in this industry and, you know, and making sure they monetize their skills even better. It reminds me of dynamic pricing in airlines. I mean, it almost seems like you have achieved some fashion of dynamic pricing in terms of the same service offered at different times of the week or day, offered by the right person or not the right person can vary. Yes. Yeah. And, and the pricing will be determined by the system. Yeah. The parameters are more diverse in our space than, you know, just a hotel room or just a airline chair because, no, I want this chair or the, you know, the, who do you want to wait on you? Yeah. You can pay the extra 800 rupees for the aisle seat on row 13. I get that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> problem. Yes. Uh, yes. Got it. Okay. So let's move on to my, um, you know, sort of last question because we are hitting that point in time when we normally conclude. Um, so this is actually a more abstract question. I think you started with a very philosophical note about your motivations to do what you did and build, of course, a very successful company. I'm curious in terms of, you know, what you have, uh, you know, done in, in terms of going about doing this business, right? If you look at people today, working professionals in their late 30s, early 40s, uh, I think you and I and a few others in our batch are examples of people who kind of quit corporate jobs to do what we're doing as entrepreneurs. But if you look at it, one of the great dilemmas of a working professional today is, you know, the two roads diverge in a wood, which one should I take? One is, of course, climb the corporate ladder which of course is a great temptation by itself because it provides security, it provides assurance, it provides less risk, and you can you know, continue to rise and grow in your corporate world, right? 
And then this other path, which is like the less trodden path, unknown path. You don't know if that road that you see is a real one or take you to a ditch and you fall into a cliff or you can actually cross the valley and you know have a great experience. So, so given these two sets of things, and I know that you've done both in your life now at this point quite well, you've had the corporate path, a few stints, and you've had the entrepreneurial stint, a couple of them. The second one now we're talking about Zenoti, which is, you know, I would say incredibly successful story. Um, what do you recommend to people in the front of the same dilemma that, you know, should I do the corporate thing more better or should I kind of take these chances, jump and, you know, try out my luck at something that I always wanted to and passionate about, but I'm not sure if the passion will translate to success. Yeah. So I think there I would say, see, you know, first is they do need to have the skill sets to be able to be successful if they want to be entrepreneurial in nature. So fundamentally building some skill sets is important. Like if I, when I was started Latitudes and I said, oh, there's a problem here. Uh, and, but if I didn't have the skill sets to solve those uh, problems or write software and for enterprise class with design beautiful software and all that stuff, then, you know, I have no business going and trying to do a startup, though I figured out there is a problem that needs solving. And I understand the problem very well because I, you know, I've spent my time in salons and spas and managed employees. I know but so you do need the skill set. So that's one thing where someone needs to be very present to saying, hey, do you have the skill sets to fundamentally build a product and of, of a certain caliber and quality? Uh, the second skill set is, of course, the sales and marketing skill set. And as I said, Shandu, when I started my first company, I definitely didn't have those skill sets. I just jumped out and started doing it and realized, oh, sometimes we don't know what we don't know, unfortunately. But nowadays, I think there's more ecosystems that help people to understand what it means to do a startup. So some amount of awareness around uh, sales and marketing, or even at least having the right set of people with you who someone else who knows sales and marketing is important. Now, having said that, now, even if you have both of those, the dilemma still remains because see, uh, I think even if I'd stayed at Microsoft and never quit Microsoft, and there's a lot of my friends who are there, I would have done phenomenally well even there in my career, right? I mean, there's no difference in it, right? It's a personal choice of saying, you know, what gets you very passionate? So following your passion is very important. Otherwise, you know, life goes by and before you know, you die. And then you say, hey, I wish I'd done something different kind of stuff. So I think I'm always happy that I made the choices I made uh, along the way. Uh, but the one thing I would say, people assume that entrepreneurialness is about risky business. People think it's risk. I would say that it's not risky, by the way. Uh, it is uncertainty that is the thing you deal with. It is not risk, you know. If you really, like when I started Zenoti, if I really uh, am capable of solving the product and I do have the ability to start and, you know, build a product and sell and I have the skill sets, then why is it risky? It's not risky. It's just uncertain because if sitting in a large company, life is very cushy, you know, you, you, with certainty, this business model has been established and you know, people pay the bills every month uh, for a large company, whether it's Oracle or whatever, and you'll get your paycheck every month. Whereas in a, this space, it is uncertain how you navigate, who you're going to meet, how you're going to, you know, make things come together, the product and the investment and the money and all that stuff. So entrepreneurs are good at dealing with uncertainty. They don't need things to be certain for them. Like, you know, this is where, like, I mean, honestly, many of us think everything in the, like in the US, I think people are even more demanding about certainty in their minds, right? Because you want to know how long it's going to take from driving from, uh, you know, here to the airport. It's 20 minutes. If it's, if you can't know that answer with certainty, it seems like crazy. How do you live life without knowing that answer kind of stuff? Whereas in India, we are used to the uncertainty. We say, all right, we don't know. And let's get in the car. Let's start driving. Will the plumber come on time? You don't know whether the plumber will come on time. We are used to the uncertainty of life and you need to know life fundamentally is uncertain. It is not uh, something you and I get to control every day, what happens in our lives. And always it is something unknown that comes into our lives which changes our lives. So I think entrepreneurs need to realize, look, you are just signing up for a boatload of uncertainty, but it's not risk because you can always go back and earn money. Making money is not a big deal. Anybody can go and if you have the skill sets of building great products, yeah, I could have chosen to go and work at Microsoft even or any other company uh, before starting Zenoti. That was my intention. So I think what you've established is a very important philosophy, uh, philosophical point, which is the illusion of control, right? We all believe that we are in control of our destiny, but in reality, we are not. So yes. uh, might as well uh, embrace the uncertainty in its true form and you know try to you know apply your passion uh, to what you think is your real you know sort of skill set, destiny, and where it can take you. So wonderful. I think this has been a great session. Uh, I just want to end with a little anecdote uh, for the benefit of all of us. Um, 
So here, as you can see, all of you have been in this conversation the last one hour. So here has always been one of the most generous people that I've known. And then you know, we've had this in the very beginning. I remember, so here you might still remember, I, you know, when you came back from the US on one trip in the summer vacation, you brought this Black Max tennis racket, which McEnroe was using. And I think you just gave it to me. And I must have <laughs> the Black, Black Max tennis racket is still in my cupboard. It's one of the rackets I have when I play tennis now. So it's been what, perhaps, uh, close to 35 years or since we have left IIT campus, but the racket you gave me is still with me. So thank you so much, uh, Sudhir, yeah. for joining us today. And uh, yeah. it's great to have you and look forward to hosting you again in the future when you scale more milestones and greater heights. And congratulations great. for the future. Great. Thanks. Thanks. I didn't know you still have the racket, but you used to play tennis exceptionally well in our batch. So I'm sure you deserve to keep that racket than any of us. So, yeah. yes. Thank you so great. much. So that's one investment Thanks. you made actually worked out. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Bye, folks. Bye. Yeah.